Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you about a subject that you already know more about than any other person on the planet because I'm going to be talking about you. I'm going to be talking about every single person in this room. I'll be talking about everyone who listens uh, to this program. Let me give you a little bit of background of where I'm coming from on this. We've been working, that is to say, doing research for almost six decades uh, with between two and three hundred thousand people on every continent now except for the Antarctic. And in the course of doing that work, we've learned two fundamental lessons about what we're like as human beings. And I want you to think about yourself and the people that are most important to you in everything that I say. It makes no difference who you are in terms of race, gender, language, other kinds of, of uh, defining conditions. We're talking now about what we're like as human beings. We've learned two basic lessons in the course of six decades of work with people uh, everywhere on our planet. Okay. First lesson that we've learned is that you and I, we understand ourselves to be cared about or not cared about by the people that are most important to us in the same four ways. And I'm going to invite you to think about yourself in a moment of where you fall on a continuum in your relationship to the person or people that are most important to you in your life or were, like parents and so forth. The second fundamental lesson that we've learned is that depending on where we fall on this continuum of being cared about, wanted, appreciated, loved, whatever word you care to use, um, that we call it acceptance, people tend to respond in exactly the same way every place in the world. So far, we found no exceptions in any population of the world. There are some individuals who are exceptions, but not populations. So now, think about someone who's really important in your life, a parent, an intimate partner, someone else that it makes a difference uh, in your sense of who you are and, and your feelings about yourself. Place yourself on this continuum we're not either accepted or rejected, but we all fall someplace along a dimension of being more or less accepted or rejected. Accepted, how warm and affectionate do you view, oh, let's say your partner, your intimate partner. How warm and affectionate do you see that person as being? Or a warm and affectionate of, of your parent, either parent having been toward you when you were a kid growing up at home. Alternatively, how cold and unaffectionate, how hostile and aggressive has that person been toward you, your feelings about it, how indifferent or neglecting is that person toward you, and your feelings of what we call undifferentiated rejection, your feeling that this person who is so important in your life really doesn't appreciate you, want you, care about you, love you, whatever that feeling is, that is to say, from our perspective, we call that feelings of rejection. Think about that person now. What we have found, people every place on our planet respond in exactly the same way as populations. There are some individuals who are somewhat different. They're able, better able to cope than others. Respond in exactly the same way to the feelings of rejection. We get anxious. We get insecure then we start to get angry. And then this, this, this specific cluster of things that I'm showing on the screen behind me start to happen to us. And it spins out into all kinds of other things if we feel rejected by the person, especially for kids, growing up in a family where they don't feel wanted, appreciated, loved, and so forth. Um, it spins out into all other kinds of things like issues of depression, suicide, suicide ideation, drug abuse, conduct problems in school, and it goes on and on and on. Years ago, a distinguished colleague of mine, this was some years ago now, said, Ron, these are just, these are just feelings that people have. They're not real. They're not important. Hurt feelings, so what? Get over it. Well, what we've learned in recent years with uh, the development of neurosciences, 
neuropsychology and neurobiology and biochemistry and so forth, that these aren't simply epiphenomena. This isn't simply something that is transitory. In fact, it affects brain structure. The feelings of rejection by this very powerful person in our life lights up the same part of the brain that physical pain does. Imagine you, you, you slammed your, your thumb in, in a car door or something else that really hurts. That hurts. Three weeks later, you're going to remember, boy, that hurt. But you're not going to feel the pain. With rejection, when you remember it, it will light up your brain in the same way that it did when you first experienced it, or it can do that. More importantly, perhaps in some ways, for kids that are raised in rejecting families with abuse and neglect and other forms of psychological uh, rejection and so forth, it actually changes the structure of the brain. The brain structure and the brain function is different, measurably different for children who experienced rejection. Regions of the brain that, get them, that, are, that are essential for learning, for memory, for emotion uh, control, emotional control, a whole range of things get impacted by the rejection process. Some of us, there are about 100 people in the room, I suppose, now. I know that there are at least seven to 10 of you who experience very painfully these things that I'm talking about in the United States. Typically, it's on the order of 7 to 10 percent of every sample, every population that we've worked with experience, have experienced this in a very serious way. Which, the good side of that is that, you know, 90 percent or more of us have grown up with more or less love in our families. But we, we, many of us know people who have experienced these kinds of things that the, the issues of, of anger and, and emotional unresponsiveness and emotional instability and so forth that spin out into these other directions. Now, with the brain structure, with the neurobiological, neuropsychological effects of it, it also tends, it tends to continue on throughout the lifespan. So that now in adulthood, those of us who had been rejected as kids and there's these, these issues that I've talked about in terms of the personality things, the overall psychological adjustment, some of the neurobiological, neuropsychological impacts of, of the rejection process, it extends on into adulthood and makes us more susceptible and more vulnerable to a whole range of biomedical issues, more susceptible to cancers, diabetes, allergies of one kind or another, and the list of things goes on, probably also impacting the lifespan. There's some of these things that, of course, we don't really know fully about. So we're clearly talking about something that, in fact, in my six decades of reading developmental literature, psychological development literature, and studying people around the world, I have not yet personally found anything that impacts this as consistently over a, such a long period of time in our lives of people everywhere, regardless of the differences of race, language, culture, gender, and so forth, as this experience of being cared about, feeling cared about or not. Now, some people deny, I don't need to be cared about. I don't need to be loved. I don't need to be hugged. Well, that is people who were rejected. That's not uncommon. We've, that's an issue that we call defensive independence. It hurts too much. You've been hurt too much. And by the way, I'm, we're not pathologizing people when we're talking about this. These are normal, natural, expectable consequences of the rejection process. Something that we all tend to experience. And we need to understand that, that these are normal responses that we're wired as human beings to respond, to understand ourselves to be cared about in the same way or not, and to respond in the same way when we feel that we are these fundamental needs that we have for care, support, love are not being met. Now, I don't want to 
depress you totally. So let me talk a little bit just about the benefits of feeling cared about, accepted, loved, appreciated, wanted. It acts as a significant buffer against all these negative effects and many, many more that I don't, haven't even suggested to you, uh, effects of rejection. It's a buffer against those, developing those. But feeling cared about for kids growing up in families where they feel loved, it has a, 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 an impact in its own right. That is to say, for example, kids who are raised in loving families are, tend to be more pro-social. They're more, they tend more toward being helpful. They tend more toward being, uh, well, a whole range of things that, that, we, as par that we as parents want uh, in our kids. So not only is it a buffer against the uh, effects of rejection, but it has all manner of, of uh, advantages in its own right. Then recently we found some, something that is really quite interesting to me and I think probably to you. All of you have thought, I hope by now, and everybody listening to this presentation about your, relation, your own personal relationship with that other person or people that are so important to you. And where do you, where do you put yourself on these dimensions of warmth and affection on the one hand, and some of these issues of psychological adjustment and personality dispositions <clears throat> on the other? We have a fundamental need for positive response from the people that are important to us. We're a social animal built into our biological evolutionary foundations of what we are as human beings, apparently. Otherwise, why would we find no exceptions in any population in the world? What, we, what I want to do then is, as a catalyst for change in a very troubled world that we all know about, I want at this moment to, oh, I, was, I, I forgot to say, so what we've learned is that being able to give affection has benefits over and above receiving affection. So much, most of my work in the past six decades has been what happens to us when we receive love or don't, but we're discovering in recent times, in the work of other people like Corey Floyd and, and his associates, that giving, being able to give affection has benefits over and above the benefits of receiving affection. Health benefits, psychological benefits, and whatnot. With that thought in mind, then, I want to be a catalyst of change by inviting every person Please stand up and hug the person next to you. Please stand up and hug the person next to you. Would somebody come and hug me? I need a hug. Thank you. <laughs> and for those of you who want more information about this, please visit uh, our website. It goes on and on. It takes about a full semester or more to go through the details of this. So thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. <clears throat>